Today, we continue the conversation with a living legend. Born in 1937 in Balmain, New South Wales, she brought pride to her country with her lightning fast world record times in the pool. And yet somehow, Wikipedia still qualifies her as a larrikin. <laughs> so the Canadian in me is gonna ask about this because I'm not really sure what it even means. But in 1999, Dawn Fraser was voted world's greatest living female water sports champion by the International Olympic Committee. Now that's a mouthful, but it's for feats such as being one of only three swimmers in the world to have won the same Olympic individual event three times. So just to contextualize this, everyone, Michael Phelps is one of the other two. You got it? So here we are able to be with someone who held the 100 meter freestyle world record for more than 15 years. Incredible. All of this, and yet it's some of her bigger controversies at the 1964 Tokyo Games that remain in Aussie history. I thought it was pretty cool that we're going to talk about some of this since, you know, we're debating the current Olympic Games being postponed, I think for the first time in history. So at those games, Donnie decided to march in the opening ceremonies against the governing body's wishes. And then she was accused of stealing an Olympic flag from a flagpole outside Emperor Hirohito's palace. And I don't know why, but it kind of makes me proud of her to read that, but that's just my personality. And then she was later suspended though for 10 years by the Australian Swimming Union for it. And she ended up retiring under that suspension. So not a great end to that story. So I, read that she was actually in a car crash weeks before those games where her mother Rose was killed and her and her sister survived. And it had me wondering what the impact of those tragedies really had on her. And we oftentimes overlook things like that because someone like Donnie actually managed to win a gold and a silver medal at those games. But my mind needs to know how does one woman one girl, one person handle all of that and still perform. So at a spry 83 years old, she can be found these days spending her isolation days with her daughter and grandson on the Sunshine Coast. She tells me it's awful. She can't stand being cooped up, but man, she knows her Netflix. So it may be a far cry from her stint in politics. She continues to mentor and contribute to upcoming athletes and swimmers alike. And she just always seems to be in the mix. So Donnie, I'm really appreciative that you took time out of your busy isolation schedule today to chat to all the other people in isolation today. So how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. I really, I am a bit uh, you know, sort of bored with being locked up in the house, but you know, we've got a beautiful jetty and we see a lovely, we're on the canal, so we see some lovely waves and birds coming in. And at the moment uh, I've got uh, a water dragon I'm feeding. I've got a ni nice butcher bird I'm feeding. I'm feeding my t our two dogs. Um, I'm glad there's no snakes around, but we've got now baby water dragons, which is keeping us uh, motivated and keeping us sort of uh, laughing. I think that's very, very important. Mm. And it's, it's interesting how nature um, is kind of rising up to all of us. We, we, my daughters um, found the word boredom as well. And I think what's interesting about the word boredom is that she's also finding so many more things that she never saw before. So sounds like you're doing the same thing, but please give me the definition of larrikin. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And do you agree that it characterizes you? Well, it's an Australian word that we've used for um, a long, long time. And a larrikin is somebody that gets up and goes. And I'm, I'm one of those people. I've always been a larrikin since I was a little girl. Um, you couldn't hold me inside the doors. And that's why I'm feeling this ISO very, very badly is the fact that I can't get out and do things but as I said we have to stay inside for our health and I think it's extremely important that we stay in our own homes to stay safe and and careful of what we do. You know there's a lot of attention around they're using the word elderly yes and I want to talk to you about that because I know that for Nat's parents who've been staying with us they've sort of been confronted with this all eyes on their age category including um, Nat's mom being pointed out at the grocery store that she should not have been there. And I know that's quite confronting. Are you experiencing anything around this virus and how you relate to your age? 
Well, I think, you know, first of all, I've got to say I'm only 82, not 83. Oh, how rude. <laughs> that's all right. I'm 83 in September, but that's fine. <laughs> Um, I don't think people would be game enough to say anything to me about not being in the shops because they know that I would come back at them. And, you know, we stay our distance. Jackson and I, when we go to the shopping, we wipe the trolleys down, but now they're wiping the trolleys down before we touch them. Uh, I put a, pl a plastic bag over the handles. Uh, we just go and buy what we want. He stands in the line and I go outside and wait for him to pack the groceries, what we need, and then I we get back in the car, then we sanitise our hands, we sanitise all the car, and, uh, you know, we're, we're playing it safe, and I think that's very important to do. Yeah, good on you. Okay, I have to, I just picked up on what you just said about they wouldn't dare tell you because they know you just come back. So is that little rebellion inside of you? What, it's still what there. It, <laughs> yeah, I get that it's still there. And what's it, what do you think it is? Like, you've had all these years to sit with that, in, in your personality, is it that you don't like being told what to do or is it that you have another view of how it could be done better? Like, how do you think about being a little rebellious? Well, I think it was because I was the youngest of eight in the family. And I, um, you know, I was brought up with two brothers closest to me and um, I had to fight for everything I wanted. If I wanted to play marbles, I had to fight my brothers for them. If I wanted to play cricket, I had to fight my brothers for it. Uh, and I guess it gave me that rebellion within me that made me want to do good. And I think, you know, that's what I thought about after the car accident where I, you know, I was the driver that killed my mother. And, you know, it was always there in my mind, okay, I was the driver of the car. I couldn't talk about it for years and years and years, but I can now. And I think, you know, that sort of was that, that rebellion within me, I'm going to do this for mum. Cause she was going to come to Tokyo, the people of Belmain had raised up enough money to uh, send her across to Tokyo for the games and, uh, and pay all the fare and all the hotel accommodation. And as she wasn't able to go there because she wasn't alive anymore, I thought, well, I've got to win this gold medal for my mother. Wow. Okay. I didn't even know that part of the story. And so is that how you dealt with the grief was to focus on something that you could do for her? Yes. It, it was a sort of funny thing, Sarah, because... You know, my brothers told me that my mother, my, my eldest brother who came into the hospital told me that my mother had had a heart attack, right? And I believed that because my mum did have a bad heart. Uh, but I was still driving the car that, that she was sitting in. I, we were taking my sister home to Kaima. And um, it wasn't until the, uh, the coroner's court that uh, I had to front that uh, the coroner told me that I was a driver and my mother was killed in that car accident. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I got to... With, with my team members in, in 1964, when we were training up in, in, um, in uh, Townsville, they all helped, you know, stand behind, stood behind me and helped me get through the grief that I was going through. And I felt, you know, I had to do not only something for my mum, but for my team members too, because they were the ones that supported me. Uh, if they saw me down and out in, in, within my training, they would come and say, come on, we'll go over to Arnie Nils and have a, a milkshake and some donuts. And, Donuts was one of my favourite foods, so that got me going again. <laughs> <laughs> Donuts will get you on it, over anything. Okay, so I'm getting that your teammates were really supportive, and yet somehow, just from an outsider, observing what happened at those games, whether it was rebellion, you know, the, the controversy of what went on there, you performed, and then there were things that the, the governing body didn't agree with. Did you guys have an oppositional relationship or what, what was it kind of like out there? Your teammates supported you, but they sort of had other ideas of what you should be doing? Yeah, well, see, our manager was the uh, part of the Australian Swimming Union. The board was all made up of all men. And I was told at 12 years of age by the, the uh, Secretary General at that age that I would never, you know, I had to go to his office and with my cousin who was coaching me at the time. And he sat behind this big desk and hit his... Uh, he pissed on his office and said, you will never, ever represent Australia at any swimming event. And I got up and hit the table and said, yes, I will. <laughs> and walked out of his office. <laughs> but you see, that's the way my father, being Scottish, brought the whole family up, was to speak our mind, to do what we did, but not to hurt others. Um, I don't think I hurt any person as I was growing up or anything like that. But I was being hurt in the other way. You know? And as Burge Phillips said, that, you know, I would never represent Australia. I mean, he gave me the stepping stones to, 
to have the guts to be able to do it. And I did that. And I always had that motivation behind my, in my head. Wow. So I have to ask about you as a girl and as a woman. So it sounds like you had such strong influences from your brothers and your dad and your, how did you see yourself as a woman at that time? And did you ever get told to step in line, to act differently? Um, I, I think the only time I got told to step in line was at the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics. And uh, our, our manager of the team, our manager rest of the team said, yes, we could, if we, if we were swimming within 24 hours of the, uh, after the opening ceremony, we could not march. I worked it out, I was swimming about 38 hours after the opening ceremony. So I worked it all out and I went to our chef de mission and I said to him, uh, look, I'm not swimming until 38 hours after the opening ceremony. Can I march? He said, yes. I went to the manageress and she said, I've got to take you into the town because the chef has told me that you can march and you haven't got gloves. So she took me into Tokyo. I got a pair of white gloves fitted, then came back to the village and got on the bus with other, my other team members. And uh, uh, the, the manager got on and said, is there anyone that should, on this bus that shouldn't be here? And they all said, no. So we just went to the opening ceremony. I marched in the opening ceremony as proud as I was. And um, he found out about it when I got back and he said, I'm going to you know, put you on report. And I said, okay, fine. But I did, you know, I did what I wanted to do. You know, we had that privilege taken from us in 1960. And one of the most important things I think for any athlete that represents their country is the march in their opening and closing ceremony. Mm -hmm. Because awesome. it gives you, gives you some sort of um, belonging. You belong to your country and you want to do good for your country. And I think that's what, that's what I had in my mind. So glad you're sharing this because I remember Nat having different scenarios, you know, over five Olympics, there was this 24 hour rule in play for her as well. And I remember thinking, I never thought that that could have been asked of an athlete. So when you're, it's good that you're bringing that up because from an outsider looking into the Olympic games, it's like, you don't even realize that that is a mandate or a, a rule. And I know that Nat, just I laughed because that's something that she's also done, calculated it and said, I have done the maths and this is what I can do. And um, yeah, so I know that's why you and her get along so well. And I think, Sarah, I think that's, you know, what makes you a really be a woman is the fact that you have to stand up to the men that are at the top of the ladder. Because, uh, you know, going through my, my uh, sporting experience with, you know, every time I had an argument with a male, yeah. And I just kept on, you know, saying, okay, but let us do our job. You know, we've worked very hard in the swimming pool to get where we are today. I have, I have, you know, uh, in, an answer in my mind that I want to, a question in my mind that I want to achieve. And that was to do my very best for my country and also for my coach and my family. And I always put my country first. Uh, and I think, you know, that sort of gives you that inner, uh, I, I don't, I can't explain it, I suppose it's perseverance to keep on going and it gives you the strength. And is that, do you think, if you could qualify what your gift is or your strength, is it, um, are, it sounds like you're very patriotic. It sounds like, you know, was it hard work? Was it discipline or are you just like a fierce competitor or maybe all of that? It's all of it, Sarah. Yeah, okay. When I really realised that was my, in 1956 when I first got my Olympic uniform and I was introduced to the Sergeant of Arms in, um, when we were, do, we were taught how to march into the opening ceremony and he said, the best thing that you ever know for your country is what you're wearing. And that's the, chest, the, the crest on your chest. And I've always been patriotic. I've never forgotten those words. We're under the uh, tunnel in, in the Melbourne Cricket Ground and he said that to us and that gave, made me very patriotic. I wanted to swim for my country and I wanted to be the best swimmer in the world. Awesome, I love that. It's so good to, for everybody to hear that message, especially young athletes, mm -hmm. um, to hear you know, the crest on your chest and that pride. Yes. Um, because I think sometimes we take it for granted. I think this situation that we're in right now is really, the, the veil has fallen in terms of taking things for granted. So we've just had an Olympic Games postponed. Yeah. Has that ever happened in history that you know about? No, it's never ha happened in the history of the, since 1896. And this is the first time. And I think that the IOC have done the best thing possible. Yeah. They've postponed it for next year. 
And I hear some of the athletes saying, oh, well, I was getting ready. Look, all I can say to them, and I will say to the kids that I am mentoring, okay, when I was swimming, I had five months of training. We had six months of training. We had no heated swimming pools. We had to swim in cold water. I can remember swimming in temperatures at 12 degrees and just kicking for kilometre or mile after mile, because that's what we, in my day was, miles, and not being able to put my face in the water because you used to get instant headaches, that wow. real ice cream feeling of headache when it's too cold. So all I'm saying to all of the athletes that I am mentor, look, it's only something being postponed, it's put on hold. Uh, you can stay out of the water for another three months if you want to, but once you get back in the water, you'll be fine. You'll take your months to get back to where you were. But you've got, still got to do your gym work. You've still got to do your running. You've still got to do your bike riding. And you've got to listen to the people that are coaching you because they know and they've worked out a, a, pro, a program for you. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So, so uh, swimmers are pretty lucky because they can go and train and swim in the ocean if they want to. You know, so that's uh, not too bad. Yeah, it was, part of me was laughing a little about what, what a Canadian would think of your um, cold water analysis. However, however, it's all relative because when you're Australian, you know, cold water is a thing. This is what yes. I've realized. Like, I keep saying grandma because now she's grandma because my daughter calls her grandma. She's not actually my grandma, but she just will not get in certain water. And I just laugh. And she was a, a swimmer as well. That's her background from um, air outside of Townsville. So, um, yeah, she's up north. So that's even more un unwilling. So, um, okay. So I want to ask you about speed in the pool. So yeah. you were a fierce competitor. You worked hard. Um, what allowed you to swim times that have never been swum before? Did you focus on things like that? Did you... Um, like I know nowadays everything's like analytical and analysis, but back then, what allowed you to do what no woman had ever done before? Having a coach called Mr. Gallagher. Uh -huh. He okay. was uh, far well before his time. And uh, we had Professor Cotton who did us, he was uh, sort of doing all of the behind the scenes work on what our body was going to be like, what we had to do. And also Professor Both, uh, he invented the, um, electrocardio group, uh, machine and uh, he, he did the testing on John Hendricks and myself in Adelaide and uh, you know they're very small things but we were being taught the scientific part of the medical side of swimming. Oh wow. Um, yeah so that, that was going back to 1955 so that was and then of course Forbes Carlos started taking underwater shots uh, up in Townsville looking at our style and our stroking and of course, now it's it, you know gone right through the computer uh, stages of any sort of sport you're doing, and uh, you know it's improved so much, and that's why the times have come down. Uh, the rules on, of swimming 100 metres is you we don't have to touch the wall with our hand anymore. They can turn at least you know uh, four, three or four metres out and touch the wall with their feet. Mm. We had to touch the wall with our hands. So the rules have changed, and that's why swimming is much faster today. Um, and I just think the training Mr Gallagher gave me and he was very specific and my, my uh, I was an eight beat kicker and um, you know I had a long stroke I had a straight arm stroke under the water and Forbes Carlos tried to tell me to change it but it felt awkward but I was much, you know, much better with a straight arm underneath the water and I got more power out of it and that's where you know doing the pulleys I used to do a thousand pulleys a day and that helped me tremendously strengthen my forearms and my uh, biceps and my triceps. And that's what we need for swimming. A thousand pulleys a day. Wow, that's awesome. I love hearing that. It's like visions of a Rocky movie, a la swimming style. Um, okay, so my vision here is that you had people in your team who are leading edge in terms of the science. Did that give you mentally an edge? Like, did, how did you think about being the best in the world and swimming a world record. Did you just go, I know I can do that? How, like, how do you approach? All right, well, my training partner was John Hendricks, a male female. Uh, he was two seconds in front of me all the time and I always tried to catch him. And that was my mental capacity. I wanted to be as good as he was because he didn't have to wear a full swimsuit. He could just wear buggies, uh, smugglers and uh, I, and, 
you know, he shaved down to all his, so I shaved my legs off the same way. And I think that's where I didn't do my arms because I didn't like doing my arms, but I did my legs and hit his whole body. And, but I just do, he was still two seconds in front of me. And that's how I, you know, sort of my mental approach to him. I wanted to catch him. I wanted to touch him on the feet and catch him. Oh, I like that. Okay, cool. So you always had something really tangible, like to chase really yes. and actually beat for that matter. And I used to do that in races too. I always used to imagine that Henrik's was in front of me all the time and I was trying to catch him. I didn't worry about my competitors uh, because I felt that if you worried about your competitors, you, they'd take your mind off what you were doing. And that's the way Mr. Gallagher and I performed, uh, you know, performed our swims. And are you a nervous person? Did you ever get nervous or scared before, let's say, at an Olympic Games or before a massive race? Um, no, I didn't in my first Olympic Games because I, you know, you're competing against the whole world. I was very nervous then. Um, and then I sort of got, I grew up and controlled it. Got it. I, I used to plan my race a week out before I swam. So that when I went to the blocks and in the Martin area, I went to the, and the blocks, I knew exactly how I was going to swim. Got it. So you're very prepared and very planned? Yes. Yeah, very much so. Are you still like that? Pretty much so, yes. Yeah. What would you say is like enduring? Like some of the qualities that you had as a little girl and then as a competitor and then even now, what's, what's enduring in you? All right. Well, when I was a little girl and, you know, playing marbles at school, I was the best marble player in the school. Um, when I left Birchgrove Primary School, I had something like 10,000 marbles that I scattered out onto the roadway so kids could have it with going to... Uh, the Birchgrave Primary School. Um, and I think, just think the determination of wanting to achieve and wanting to be good at something. Um, you know, I, I learned, I was a dressmaker and that was my trade. I learned all the machines that um, Mrs. Levesky taught me. I used every machine that was made to, um, to do any sort of tailing or dressmaking. Um, and I, I just think, you know, that's the way I am today. I like to plan things and, and know that if anything goes wrong, I get cranky. Do you? Yes. And are you like, like, do you like accomplishing things these days? Do you like, obviously, what's the analogy these days for having the most marbles? Like, well, I think it, I just, I was the best in school. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's how I wanted to be at swimming. Um, I didn't want to have to, you know, my father gave me, Mr. Gallagher moved to Adelaide in 1955 and he wanted me to go down there and live and train at the pool. He got the lease of the city bars down. And we sat and talked to my dad and my dad said, well, in my family, she's not 21 years of age yet. And anyone, any girls in the family that are not 21 can't do anything. And I said, dad, just give me this opportunity, please. So my father gave me six months and I was coming back to Sydney to swim in the Australasian Championships. If I hadn't won in Sydney, I wasn't allowed to go back to, to Adelaide to live. And I wanted to achieve that. And that's the way Mr. Gallagher and I planned, is that I was going to train all the time. And in the winter time, we went to Broken Hill Mines and they had a 30, 25 metre pool there. They allowed us to train in the winter time before we could train in, because um, I had to go to Adelaide uh, for six months prior to be, I had to be a registered swimmer. So I had to be in Adelaide for six months before I could swim for any state. And so I, that's mm -hmm. where I started off my career, you know? So I'm like, when I hear your stories, I, I'm remembering this Michael Phelps interview with Tony Robbins where he was describing his training with his coach. So as you talk about you and Gallagher, I think of him and then I, he just he goes through this kind of whole sequence of all of his olympics and all this and then he talks about when it was over and how he wasn't coping how do you feel that you were able to cope with life after sport when it seems like a lot of athletes are struggling okay i uh, because of i got banned for 10 years by uh, bill birch phillips and his Rand swimming union I had, uh, at the time, there was a uh, Chief Justice, Sir Leslie Heron, and he said that he, did, he thought it was wrong of me to be banned for that. So he gave me the name of another Chief Justice, um, Elliot, 
Evett, and he was a JP. So he uh, said, no, we're going to fight this man. So we, he took a Bill Birch Phillips to court. And after, I think, three months of court case, I won the court case. And the judge said to Bill Birch Phillips, I suggest that you shake hands with Miss Fraser. I turned around to shake hands and Birch Phillips turned around and wouldn't shake hands with me. Uh, that took three years for that court case to go through. And by that time, uh, you know, I sort of got married. I had Dawn Lorraine. Um, I went to Townsville to live, tried to get over the fact that, um, you know, I was, I was banned. I wanted to get, I wanted to go to Mexico City, uh, but I didn't have the time to train. And I had a baby to look after, mm. but um, that was, that was a hard part of my life to get over. And uh, I really, if I don't hate, I can't use the word hate. And, but I really disliked Burge Phillips for not shaking my hand. And that showed what sort of a character he was. And many years later, I was up in Brisbane at the centenary pool and the Australian water polo team were training up there. And a young man got banned from the pool. And as they were walking out, it was Bill Birch Phillips' son. And I said to him, well, it happens to the best if it doesn't, Bill. And that gave me the greatest satisfaction in my life. And that allowed me to retire in <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those beautiful stories. It's called retribution. That's right. <laughs> You're awesome. Oh, tell it like it is. Yeah. Oh, it's like uh, when I hear those stories, I get so frustrated and irritated because sometimes I feel that administrators make decisions about people's lives. I have a really good friend who something administrative happened for her, mm -hmm. for her Olympic dream as well. And it's just, if only they knew. And now they will know through his son's experience. Yeah, exactly That's right. All the way. Which, okay, so that was interesting that, uh, thank you for saying that because here we are all these years later being able to reflect upon, just like Phelps, you also, that transition period was really terrible. It was yeah, really hard. It's very difficult. And, uh, you know, sort of a, a few of my swimmers that I've been mentoring lately, uh, the last couple of years, have retired and, and they're getting on with their life because they're now going back to uh, the universities and they're doing mm. something. And that's allowing the women of the world today to be able to do something. Whereas in my day, mm. uh, I was a woman and I was put on the sideline. No, sorry, this is not for you. But that doesn't happen today. And I hope to think that I, I can be regarded as a, as a person that really has fought that because I have fought for for women's equality in this country. And I think we, we've nearly achieved that. And I think it's very important that I was a pioneer to start all that off. Awesome. Um, Nat and I both actually are really passionate about what you've just said and that stories like this be told because um, Daphne Fancutt is a, an amazing tennis character. I don't know if you know her, um, but man, she could tell a story about what she's been through and some of the things that she was told and what she also stood up, she reminds me a lot of you in that she would just, they would tell her, they would try to shift her off court, off of center court, because they had a men's match that they wanted to put in front and she just refused to leave the court. Good, uh, good. Exactly. So I thought, good on her, um, you know, in a sport that now has, you know, a lot more equality and... Um, fantastic, yeah. Yeah, so these are important stories. And so you work with a lot of young athletes. What would you say, what do you detect in a young person that lets you know that this person has the potential to do something special? Well, in swimming, I can usually pick it. I can pick up the potential of their style. Uh, and when you talk to them, what they want to do, what they want to achieve. Um, there's a young kid by the name of, uh, it'll come to my head in a minute, mm -hmm. but there's a few young kids around. And when Swimming Australia has sorted it all out with putting the junior swimming up to 17 years of age, into a championship and then up over the 17 and over as open it gives the young kids at 13 14 years of age the ability to try and perform their to their best to get into the open mm. uh, events because and i think that's that has helped that has given them um a goal to go for it sure. sets their examples very high and i think that's very very important and that's what i say to them try and achieve what you can achieve Mm -hmm. I can't do it for you. All I can do is help you mentally get into it and do what you want to do. Yes, it's going to hurt. Every, everyone that swims or everyone that uh, plays sport, they have to go through hurt. 
Mm. And if you get over that, that's the most important thing. You then jump the hurdle and it doesn't ever come back. I love that. I love how, you know, you say to the athletes, do what you can do. It Mm. reminds me of like, it's their Hendrix. Because what you could do is like grab for his feet grab for what was right in front of you. And, and it's so important nowadays when people have more access to stories, they might want a result that someone's had. And yet it's sometimes I feel like it's too far away. Like they're looking so far in front that they forget to reach just for that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. It's like walking upstairs. You take one step at the yeah, time. You right. can't take the bottom step and then jump to the top. Because there's a lot, lot in the middle that you, uh, it's a big hurdle. You've got to get through that. You've got to take, and I'd say to them, take one step at a time. Okay, this, this month you might be going for, say, a 60 second 100 metre swim. Next month, you're going to go for a 59.9 or 59.5. We're going to try and achieve this. Like just recently, I had, um, I was at Noosa Surf Club and we had a, um, a, a fundraising there and we had a couple of, of our Olympic swimmers and long distance swims and then one particular boy i'm not going to mention his name because i don't want to embarrass him and all he has to do is take 10 seconds off a 10 kilometer swim and i said to him i got him aside and i said now what's your problem he said it's mental doing i said okay look at it this way one second every kilometer and he went i won't tell you what he said (laughs) but it's that's easy I said, I know it's easy. All you have to do is every kilometre, I'm going to take one second off. That's all you have to do. And he's he qualified for the Tokyo Olympics. Now he's got 12 months or 18 months now, or 12 months it is, to wow. really achieve that. And he rings me up and says, I've done one second. That's all we have. Only nine oh, <laughs> yes. That's just awesome, isn't it? It's like it was there right in front of him, but he couldn't see it. And that's what mentorship and... Uh, we talked about Netflix before we pressed the go button and this formula one show talks about Nikki Lauda, um, the Austrian driver and yeah. what an impact he had on the team that just continued to win. I've in been formula in the car one. with Nikki Lauda. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he drove me around the racetrack. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic. When you were talking, that's, isn't that funny? Like ener- the energy, that's what I felt because they talk about him in this, such a beautiful way and when you talk i think to myself what a gift for australians to be able to you know these young athletes being able to i don't know just be in your presence because there are the words that you say but it's the it's the way that you say it it's Mm -hmm. it's there's something about that that's kind of indescribable so there you go you know (laughs) nikki love yeah that's okay beautiful isn't that funny my last question is about jackson Yes. I want to come full circle because we know that time in your life, pregnant with Don Lorraine, who then had later had Jackson, which is so beautiful. And now you're all in isolation together. What do you tell him or how does it come through you about trusting his own voice and being able to live his life the way you have really kind of forged your own path? Well, I think it's important that he, you know, he's sort of growing up individually. Uh, He doesn't have to follow in my footsteps. Uh, I, I did was very dominant on him to m- make him swim 400 metres before he stopped going to training because we go out on the jet ski and if he fell off, well, he can at least swim 400 metres to the shore. It's very, very important. Um, and secondly, you know, it, it's very difficult for a daughter or a grandson to follow in their grandmother's footsteps. And then I've always said that, you know, when I'm with, out with them for dinner, people come up and ask me for an autograph. I say, look, do you mind? This is just a very private life that I've got with my daughter and grandson. Mm-hmm. I can do it later on. I, but, you know, people do, do forget and come up whilst you're reading. And I try and give them that sort of widening that, that they don't have to be involved in it because they, they didn't achieve what I achieved and they shouldn't have to be interrupted with their time with me. And that's the way I, I really, I really want it. And I, I do get, get it a lot, which is fantastic. What's his relationship actually to your past? Um, well, there's not much relationship. Yeah, there. that's what I thought. But yeah. Because we are experiencing that with Jordan in that there's no context for her around volleyball 
around mm-hmm. Olympic, hardly anything actually. She has a bum bag that has an Australian something on it. And like, she kind of knows the words, but she doesn't even know what that means. And I was thinking with just having been around you and Jackson and Don Lorraine, it's like, it's just so normal. It's not yeah, like. It is normal. And you've yeah. got to keep it a normal life because, um, you know, they can't live on what you've achieved. And it's very, very important. Uh, and he's, you know, he's doing very good at field work and uh, he's extremely good at Japanese. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's something for him to, you know, live by and do what he wants to do. I mean, I, I'm not sort of pushing him into anything that he must, he must be doing. He's got to do that himself. He's got to make his own decisions. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, he, I'm just letting him live and grow up to be a nice young man. That's awesome. People Thank you so much. Like, I really, I really get from your answer the, the humility that you have. I've been around and that humility is just felt, hence why you want you know, the autograph thing, just to have your time, because you've just established that, a sense of being a human um, first. And I want to thank you for chatting to us all in this space. What an opportunity we have in isolation. We should just do interviews all day. This is awesome. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, my love.